Hi everybody. In this lecture, I'd like to talk about Boltzmann factors. And this is for thermal physics, physics 3230 at Appalachian State. And we use, of course, Schroeder's thermal physics as our text. So, let's talk some Boltzmann statistics. So, at the very beginning, um, just picture it this way. Let's say that we have a collection of n atoms. And let's say, for example, that they're hydrogen atoms, which we understand the structure of pretty well. Okay? Now, these atoms can have electrons that are in different energy states. Now, some of those electrons might be in the ground state, n equal to 1, and some could be in excited states with n greater than 1, right? Now, it seems kind of obvious that if your gas gets hotter, then that means that you'll have more energy to excite those electrons in those hydrogen atoms into excited states. So it seems like if you get a hotter gas, then more of those hydrogen atoms should have electrons in excited states. So what we would like to know um, for thermal physics, thermodynamics, is is there a way to calculate the likelihood that an atom's electron is in an excited state or in any state whatsoever? And so the answer to that is yes, we're going to use Boltzmann factors to do that, okay? So let me derive really quickly a Boltzmann factor for you. Let's say that we want to know the likelihood that the electron is in an excited state. Let's say the first excited state where n is equal to 2. And we're going to compare that to the likelihood that it's in the ground state, n equal to 1. So remember that we said that any probability would be equal to the multiplicity of the state of interest, we'll call it omega a, divided by the total multiplicity for all possibilities, omega total. So that would be our probability. Now here's the neat thing. If we want to know the probability of state 2, for example, n equal to 2, relative to the ground state, state 1, n equal to 1, then what we could do is set up this equation. Omega 2 divided by omega total divided by omega 1 divided by omega total. See, this on the top is the probability that you're in state 2, and this on the bottom is the probability that you're in state 1. Okay? Now, the ratio here, that means that you're canceling out that omega total. So you don't have to know the multiplicity for all possibilities, right? You just need to know the ratio of omega 2 to omega 1 to figure out the relative probability of state 2 with respect to 1. Now, let's go with the definition of entropy, where S is equal to K times the natural log of omega. So this is the most basic definition of entropy. What that means is, of course, that the entropy um, a change in the entropy means the multiplicity changed. Now, we could say also, solving for omega, that omega is equal to e to the s over k power. Okay, just taking, raising both sides to the power of e, right? So that means that omega 2 would be e to the s 2 over k, and omega 1 would be e to the s 1 over k. So if we take the ratio of those two things, then uh, what we would end up with is e to the delta s over k. Because remember, when you divide um, in exponents, it's the same thing as subtracting, right? So it would be e to the power of s2 minus s1 divided by k. Now, this is a delta s, a change in entropy, basically, if we're going from state 1 to state 2. We can use the thermodynamic identity to figure out what delta s would be. Okay, remember that if we rearrange the thermodynamic identity and solve for delta S, we can get delta S is equal to 1 over T times delta U plus P delta V minus mu delta N. Okay, now here, of course, T is the temperature, U is the internal energy, P is the pressure, V is the volume, N is the number of particles, and mu is your chemical potential. Right, now U here would be the internal energy of the reservoir of all those atoms, of the n atoms. If a particular atom would move up in energy by a collision with another atom, for example, then the reservoir would lose energy and that atom would gain it. Okay, so there's this exchange of energies. Now, let's simplify our problem by assuming that we have a constant number of particles n and that the change in volume of an atom 
when it goes through an excited state change is negligible. I mean, it, it, we're talking very small numbers here. So we're going to ignore delta V. So if N is fixed and delta V is, you know, teeny weeny, then that means that delta S would be equal to 1 over T times delta U. Okay, and yet again, this is from the thermodynamic identity. We're assuming delta V is negligible and delta N doesn't happen. There's no change in N. So that means we've got delta S is equal to 1 over T times delta U. Now, if I write this out, delta S is equal to 1 over T times the internal energy for U2 minus U1. Now, remember, if the reservoir loses energy, the atom gains it and vice versa. So that means that if you're looking at a specific atom, you could write the energy levels change for that atom, right? So delta U would be minus delta E, and that means that we would have minus 1 over T times delta E would be equal to delta S, all right? Because the energy of the reservoir U and the energy of the atom E are flipped signs from each other. The atom gets its energy from that reservoir. So that means that the relative ratio of the probabilities, probability 2 over probability 1, would be E to the delta S over K power, plugging in for that, using our thermodynamic identity, would be equal to E delta U over the KT power, and then, since delta U is minus delta E, E to the negative delta E over KT power. Now, this last term right here, that's a Boltzmann factor, and that determines the populations for different energies, okay? Now, note that it's that delta E that's present, so the energies of the excited states could just be reported relative to the ground state, and that would be how we would solve the relative probabilities. Okay, so let's do an example, and then let's talk about how to handle degeneracies. So here we have this relative ratio, probability of state 2 versus probability of state 1 is equal to our Boltzmann factor, e to the negative delta E over kT. So this is true. This straight uh, equation is true if there's no degeneracy. But if there are multiple energy states that have the same energy, right, multiple states in the same energy, so for example, in the review of atomic structure, we talked about how in the ground state, n equal to 1, l equal to 0, ml equal to 0, and then you have spin up and spin down in that state, which means that it's got a degeneracy of 2. There's two electrons that could be in that same state, right? Okay, so if that's the case, if you have a degeneracy, then you multiply your Boltzmann factor by the degeneracy of the state. So, okay, hydrogen atom. Our ground state is minus 13.6 eV. Our first excited state is minus 13.6 eV divided by 2 squared, which is 4, right? So that gives us E2 is equal to minus 3.4 eV. So the change in energy, delta E, in between those two states would be 10.2 eV. In other words, the first excited state, N equal to 2, is 10.2 eV higher in energy than the ground state, which is minus 13.6 eV. So the energy change that it would have to go through is 10.2 eV. All right, so how possible is it that something is in this first excited state relative to the ground state? If you plug this into our Boltzmann factor, E is equal to the uh, E to the power of negative delta E over KT, you're plugging in E to the power of negative 10.2 EV divided by Boltzmann's constant divided by the temperature. So, for example, if you've got a hydrogen atom in the atmosphere of the sun, which has a temperature of 5,800 Kelvin, you would plug in 5,800 Kelvin for your temperature, and then since you're using EV up top, it's more convenient to use the Boltzmann's constant that has units of EV, which is 8.617 times 10 to the minus 5 EV per Kelvin, and you plug all that in to your exponent here. That gives you E to the negative 20.4 power. And then when you solve for what that is, you get 1.37 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay? So that's the relative probability of being in that first excited state to the ground state. So you can see that it's, you know, for every billion atoms, you would have one or so that's in that first excited state, roughly. But there's two degenerate states in the ground state right, and eight degenerate states in the n equal to 2 first excited state. So for each, each state there, you therefore multiply by the, um, the degeneracy of the state. So since you're doing probability 2 over probability 1, you would multiply by eight 
for 2 divided by 2 for 1, and that means that you multiply by a factor of 4 out front. Okay? 4 out front. So it would be 4 times 1.37 times 10 to the minus 9, right? And then that would give you a probability of 5.48 times 10 to the minus 9. So that means that instead of, say, 1 in every billion atoms, you've actually got, you know, 5 or 6 in every billion atoms that are in the first excited state. All right? Okay, I hope that was understandable. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. And as always, I'll see you in class.